This is the F-16 fighter jet, developed in the United States back in the 1970s. Until recently, the United States was against transferring the aircraft to Ukraine. Mr. President, to Ukraine. But now the situation has changed, and it is possible that the transfer will take place in the near future. According to analysts and military experts, the transfer of fighter jets can fundamentally change the course of the war in favor of Ukraine. The armed forces have proven this in practice, as after receiving javelins, bayraktars, and other weapons, they successfully liberated a large part of the occupied territories from the Russian. To provide a complete chronology, let's go back to the very beginning of the full-scale invasion and track it all. You're watching Hustler. Enjoy the show. On February 24th, 2022, Russia initiated massive missile strikes on Ukrainian military bases and airfields, launching an offensive from the side of Belarus and the entire border zone. Some military bases were completely or partially destroyed, and Ukrainians began to hold their defense. Within the first three weeks of the full-scale offensive, Ukraine lost its entire borderline and faced an advance from Belarus almost towards Kyiv. During this time, the armed forces maintained their defense with their own resources. NATO countries were deciding whether or not to provide weapons to Ukraine. The first weapon deliveries took place in mid-March. At that time, the United States and Britain supplied several thousand anti-tank systems, including Javelin and Enelaw. It is difficult to determine the extent to which the new weapons affected the events in the early days of the war, since most Javelin and Enelaw systems reached military units after the invasion. However, by early March, the world was already captivated by photos and videos showing the destruction of Russian tanks by Western anti-tank missile systems. The Stinger man pads played, perhaps, a significantly more important role. One of the main problems faced by the Ukrainian armed forces in the early days of the war was the massive Russian aerial attacks. Dozens of Russian helicopters and aircraft flew in the skies over Kyiv. <laughs> This posed a threat to the defense of the capital, which did not have an adequate number of air defense systems at that time. In one of the early aid packages in March, Joe Biden included the Stinger man pads, which were intended to plug the hole in the sky. The idea of supplying stingers to Ukraine was not liked by many in the White House. There was a concern that shooting down a Russian plane with an American system could provoke Putin to escalate the situation. The argument of escalation of war would arise every time the White House dared to supply a new type of weapon to Ukraine. The situation on the front began to change. The armed forces started liberating Kyiv Oblast and eventually the entire northern Ukraine year of full-scale invasion. In April, Ukraine received a total of about 1,500 man-pads. This changed the situation in the sky, and Russia suffered heavy losses in its aviation. In fact, the majority of Russian aviation losses occurred in March, when Russia had not yet adapted to the new conditions of the war. Russia lost control of the airspace, and in the following months, Russian aviation mostly operated without crossing the front lines. Russian pilots became afraid to fly in Ukrainian airspace. Starting from April, Russia began resorting to terror by indiscriminately launching missiles at civilian targets. Ukraine requested the West to close the airspace, but once again, allies believed they couldn't use their own air defense systems or aircraft to shoot down Russian missiles, as it could be seen by Putin as direct intervention in the war. Instead, Ukraine, through a challenging process, obtained Soviet-made S-300 air defense systems and a certain amount of aviation, including spare parts necessary for the restoration of Ukrainian aircraft from Slovakia. The exact quantity of air defense systems and aviation delivered to Ukraine is not precisely known. At the same time, on April 13th, Ukrainian forces scored a direct hit on the Russian cruiser Moskva, effectively sinking it. In May, the nature of the war began to change, gradually transitioning into an artillery battle. The significant advantage of Russia in terms of the number of artillery systems and ammunition stocks largely determined the character of the combat operations. 
The Russian conveyor belt of destructive systematic shelling started to increase its pace and advance through the territory of the east, erasing one Ukrainian settlement after another. Ukraine had limited reserves of Soviet-caliber ammunition for artillery. The supply of Ukrainian developed ammunition for complexes such as Vila and guided projectiles like Kvitnik was very limited in quantity. Considering that these projectiles were being depleted rapidly in the early months, the Pentagon began to acknowledge artillery problems in Ukraine in May for the first time. In light of this, a decision was made for the United States, Canada, and Australia to jointly supply 100 M777 howitzers of NATO standard with a caliber of 155 mm. According to official reports, it was these howitzers that devastated Russian forces in Bilihorivka, resulting in the enemy army losing approximately 100 armored vehicles. The American howitzers somewhat stabilized the situation on the Eastern Front. Ukraine had the opportunity to improve the firing ratio, which on certain fronts could be as low as 10, 1, or even 21 in favor of the enemy. The M777 howitzers opened the door for long-range NATO artillery. Demonstrating the successful use of American artillery, the armed forces of Ukraine also received dozens of other systems from other countries, such as Caesar, Zuzana, Crab, M109, and others. In May and June, the United States additionally provided 36 M777 howitzers. By June, Ukraine had nearly depleted its entire stockpile of long-range missile systems, such as Smirch, Vila, and Tochka U. Despite having information about enemy targets, there was nothing left to strike them with. Finally, in mid-June, the United States decided to proceed with the first deliveries of modern multiple launch rocket systems, MLRS, in collaboration with the United Kingdom and Germany. The U.S. was to supply eight HIMARS systems, while the United Kingdom and Germany would provide three M270 systems each. Ukraine received the first systems at the end of June. It was this weaponry that became decisive in July. Dozens and possibly even hundreds of ammunition depots, military bases, and command centers were destroyed and continue to be destroyed. Ukraine gained a significant advantage within a range of 40 to 80 kilometers from the front line, where Russia no longer had a significant numerical advantage in terms of systems. And most importantly, Russian MLRS cannot be compared to Western MLRS in terms of accuracy and therefore effectiveness. While HIMARS guarantees a 98% probability of direct hits on a target measuring 10M at distances up to 80 kilometers, the projectiles for the Smirch MLRS systems have an accuracy of less than 1%. By September, the Ukrainian armed forces began reclaiming the lost territories of the Kharkiv region in the east, southeast, and northern areas of Kharkiv. Within five days, the Ukrainian military managed to liberate 338 populated areas with a population of approximately 150,000 people, seize over 300 units of military equipment, and acquire a vast quantity of weapons and ammunition. On October 8th, the Ukrainian armed forces launched an attack on the Crimean Bridge. The bridge was put out of operation, as well as the adjacent railway track. In November, the Ukrainian armed forces liberated Kherson. The main events of November included the withdrawal of Russians from Kherson and the occupied areas on the right bank of the Kherson region, as well as two massive rocket attacks by Russia on Ukraine's energy infrastructure, the second of which resulted in a blackout for several hours. Overall, since that time, the map of hostilities has remained largely unchanged. The situation on the front line remains hellish, and the military constantly needs new weapons for effective defense and counteroffensive. The question remains as to how long the West is prepared to support Ukraine with weaponry and what level of effectiveness it will achieve.